All right, everybody. How is it going? How are all of you? This has been quite a journey. <laughs> so this show was supposed to go on last week. Um, there was uh, a lot that I didn't expect that ended up happening. And, uh, well, you know, some tools didn't do exactly what I thought they were going to do. And uh, the demo didn't didn't quite work. So I ended up uh, pushing last week and, uh, oh, and hello, hi, Kears. Hello, Stupak. And hello, Brandon. How are you? How are all of you? Um, so uh, I went on kind of an insane journey. And uh, t this, this session is going to be a little bit different than most of the other sessions that I've done where um, pretty much we start from code from scratch and, you know, run from there. But today, unfortunately, there's kind of too much and I'm not exactly sure how much we're going to get through. So instead of like just trying to like code everything like here, I think we're going to break some of those into some of the Wednesday, you know, wine sessions and uh, we're we're going to use a few things that I built ahead of time today. And uh, after we get that, he learned NIM. I learned NIM? What did I learn NIM? Stupac. Uh, so... Anyway, uh, right, well, <laughs> this has more to do with a case study. And the entire thing sort of began with a problem that was uh, unexpected when I was uh, hanging out with um, the, uh, the Enceladosaurus. Okay, I got the accent in the right place. And uh, we were talking about learning, live learning C. And... I knew that at some point in the future, I wanted to do some stuff with FPGAs because I think uh, a bunch of you are going to be interested in that. And uh, one of the the core that I'm going to use on the FPGA is uh, based on RISC-V. And for those of you that don't know, RISC-V is, it's sort of like, it, it's, a, it's a CPU instruction set uh, and it's open, which is kind of interesting because a lot of the instruction sets that we typically use, like on this computer with x86, 64 um, or on my phone which is running arm those are those are licensed instruction sets and what's kind of cool about you know you have to pay patents to make chips and things like that and you know they're, they're pretty reasonable but um, a bunch of the educators at uh, at Cal said you know this is kind of getting a little tricky to like share a lot of this code and share cores and share designs and you know as teaching tools so why don't we go with something that we just make up which is you know based on our experience with designing instruction sets and uh, we're gonna make it open source, you know, open source hardware, and you know, you can kind of do what you want with it. So um, they did a fantastic job. So I'm gonna be leaning heavily on some of their work. And there's, uh, yeah, there is definitely a crazy journey. Yes, Dupac, this is relatively new. Um, it's it's been, I mean, it's been sort of bubbling up through the university for you know, I'd say five years or so, um, maybe ten. But you know, they. they they call it risk five because it's their fifth iteration of the risk architecture and they've you know kind of been at this for like you know 30 40 years who who knows how long since they they debuted their first versions of risk but um risk five is kind of neat because it, it follows a lot of modern you know multiprocessor stuff it, it allows for all the modern enhancements that have happened to cpus but it um it's it's very minimal and it's designed um partially for education so it's it's not trying to be like super overly complicated, but still being fairly performant if you wanted to use it in like real applications. And I mean, I think that there's, I, I could go on about RISC-V for quite a while. We're, we're, we're going to get to some of that later. But the the net net is that, I mean, they're using it in, they're building a supercomputer now. Um, I think that's in the EU um, down to, you know, open source hardware that you can run on smartphones or your own design to uh, the stuff that we're gonna be doing later on with FPGAs. We can actually just synthesize this CPU core like it's software and run applications on it, which really is software. <laughs> so it's starting to blur that line. Um, so we're gonna be covering some of that. And uh, <laughs> hey, what's up Nightshade dude? And I uh, hope you get your presentation done and I'm gonna try to get my presentation done, which uh, hopefully all of you are gonna enjoy today. Um, so without further ado, Let's um, let's get this show going because we have a lot of stuff to kind of get through. So I am going to have a little fun with that. He's 
just some guy. He makes things fast. Okay, well, this is, um, so we are in episode five. I can't believe it because this has been uh, <laughs> quite a journey <laughs> so far. And uh, today we are going to be, you know, let's see. Oh, Nightshade, I didn't realize you were going mobile today. So uh, good luck. Uh, I don't know how much of this you'll be able to see on your screen. But um, the rough plan for today is, let's let's get our rough plan up. So uh yeah, like I said, um, we're going to be doing, we're going to be talking about CPUs. All right, so what what's going on in a CPU? Well, there's there's a couple areas that we're we're going to need for um, what we're going through today, and in particular, I'm interested in Risk Five um, later on in the show, mainly because this can be easily synthesized on an FPGA. So if you want to make one of these things, you know, to sort of <laughs> run in real hardware as opposed to software demonstrations that we're going to be doing today, you can do that. Um, and what's kind of also cool about, it, I mean, anybody could just make up their own CPU, right? But, you know, this has been sort of debugged, you know, so it it has been through the paces. And most importantly, it has a tool chain. So this has been upstreamed um, into GCC. And, you know, I think there's an LLVM version of it as well. So um, you can kind of build like full blown applications, including the Linux kernel, including um, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and what's cool about it, as opposed to like, you know, more traditional um, architectures like, you know, Motorola 68K or, you know, a <laughs> PowerPC or I'm probably dating myself or x86-64. 64-bit version, which is really AMD's <laughs> creation, um, or, you know, what's more typical in lower power uh, devices such as the Raspberry Pi or uh, smartphone is, you know, the ARM architecture. Um, RISC-V doesn't require any licensing. So the, these are all licensed and they're, they're really good. They're really performant. We use them every day. Um, you're definitely using them in this stream just to see what I'm writing. <laughs> but uh, this is kind of a new new world because we have the ability to effectively, you know, treat this more like software and open source, which is kind of cool. All right. So what kind of stuff do you have in an instruction set? I mean, you know, you, you it really varies depending on the application. But um, in general, you know, we're talking about very, very. So we're not talking about high level stuff like, you know, you might see in JavaScript like console.log, which is actually doing like an insane amount of work to be able to handle all sorts of different things that you can throw at it. But um, we're talking about much lower level things. So these are things like, you know, like load a word from memory or store a word to memory or, you know, add to this number, which is like immediately right here as part of my operand or um, jump, which we're going to have a little fun <laughs> talking about jump and link uh, a little bit later because I found an error in the spec while I was <laughs> working on this. Um, but, you know, so this is like very, very basic programming in, in the sense that like very little is happening, you know, from instruction to instruction. So typically it takes lots of instructions to do anything kind of interesting. So, you know, we don't actually run these things directly. Like this, this gets sort of translated into binary. So it, you'll end up with these like really long binary strings, you know, which might go on. In our case, we're going to be using a 32-bit um, instruction word today. So every single instruction that runs on this CPU is 32 bits wide. So that's cool because <laughs> um, it's a fixed size. Now, there are variants of the RISC-V um, instruction set. It allows for 64-bit. It oops, yeah, I can spell too. Um, so it allows for 64 bit, you know, there's 128 bit and there's compressed, which is neat because, you know, there's a lot of redundancy when you're when you're spelling out this entire instruction word, depending on what's in there. But um, we're not going to be talking about those today. <laughs> those are those are those are much better um, understood on the web. We're looking at sort of smaller applications, the sort of thing that you know, like Pi kind, think like Raspberry Pi kind of space as opposed to like full blown computer. And we're going to be talking about single core. So, you know, the terminology that uh, the RISC-V community uses is a heart. So we're going to be talking about single heart architecture. Um, and that's going to simplify a lot of the complexity that I'm going to have to deal with. Um, so uh, this is um, 
this is the space that we're going to be operating in. All right, great. Well, what um, what I was originally planning on doing with Risk Five was I was thinking like, all right, um, th this sort of came up because I was. Um, I was talking to NC and she was like, yeah, hey, I know Python, but, you know, I, I really want to learn C, you know, and and I said, well, that that's kind of cool. Like, you know, I'll 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 teach you that, you know, let's let's just build a tool where, you know, you and me can be distributed different parts of the world and we can go connect on some learning website and, you know, we'll have a shared IDE and we'll be able to, you know, just program C, you know? <laughs> so I thought this was relatively easy. It turns out that this is actually really, really difficult. Um, for those of you who saw the learn streams, um, <laughs> and hey, what's up, Namanala Uh Yeah, that's, uh, oh, Wubba Dub is here, huh? Um, it was his voice actually in the, uh, in the intro uh, stuff. So um, I can't really see that link right now, Stu Pack, so I'm, I'm gonna have to just Oh, oh, is this um, library boot firmware? It's open source. Uh, that that um, so I haven't reviewed uh, that, but we're we're not going to be talking too much about uh, like regular firmware. We're actually talking about like the core guts of the computer. So we're talking about the CPU, which has a whole bunch of pins on it, and this literally does things like you know this is access to memory, you know, and this is access to you know some I/O devices and. And this stuff, maybe there's some power things in here, and you know, there's you know, another bus maybe for connecting to memory, or you know, like maybe we we're gonna wire USB in here, or whatever we feel like doing with our particular application. I mean, this is usually an SOC architecture, so we're not, I'm not gonna go too much into like hardware designs. There's there's better streams where you can go check that out, but. Um, you know, and then we also need to have some address pins. So, you know, typically we're saying things like, okay, this is the address and this is the data. And, you know, this this is a super oversimplified version <laughs> of a CPU. Um, why are we doing this? Well, it would be kind of cool if we could take this entire thing and sort of ship it over to Webland. Um, because what I noticed when I was trying to do these learning sessions is that there isn't a simple way to compile C applications if you're on the web. Um, so yes, uh, Wubba Dub Dub, this is, um, I, th I thought it was good that Risk Five actually fit into episode five as well. Um, so this, you know, what's neat about this is <clears throat> we have our general web environment, which doesn't have things like, you know, a GNU C compiler, you know, so like say, say we wanted to actually like compile applications. This thing is massive, all right? And using some stuff like in Mscripten, you know, we can, we can actually take this whole thing and compile it into WASM, which is WebAssembly for those of you web developers out there, um, which is basically kind of like a really stripped down version of just JavaScript. And there's some there's some optimizations available uh, for that. So this was kind of like the path I was originally thinking of going was, you know, take an off the shelf compiler, go through this pipeline and end up getting something that'll like compile down to JavaScript so that I can just embed it in a web page. And on that web page, we can have like, you know, here's a whiteboard and, you know, here's some output and, and here's a shared editor, you know, and whatever we want to compile in here could just be compiled by this JavaScript uh, piece. So what I was trying to avoid, and it's funny you bring that up, Stu Pack, because just about every solution I've seen ends up using it, is I wanted to avoid like having a server in the mix, you know? So like, it's very easy if you take this code that's over here on the shared editor, send it on up to, you know, a container or some sort of like server that's, that's divvied up and do some functioning, you know, some processing that you would do that doesn't belong in a, a web environment normally. And you could just send the results back and you know connect that up to the output. Well, that's what I ended up doing to get the the course started, and that's pretty much what most of the um, the 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 tools that I saw, aside from like I think you mentioned Pyodide um, in a different week, and that that's that's more on the like you know trying to actually run the thing in the browser. So the like the holy grail here is we figure out a way to run a C compiler in a browser um, and not use server resources. This this is a well known pattern and you know it, it 
it's understood how to do those things. Um, but it has scaling issues because you're, you're consuming server resources. So the idea was like, could we take this C and, you know, write our little like, hello world and, you know, take that thing and compile it to some sort of object file and then take that object file and run it on JavaScript and then send that result out. And then, you know, we could get back to like the business of learning C. Well, yeah. That's what I thought naively last week. <laughs> so, and then I realized, like, for reasons that we're about to get into, that um, that was a little bit of a pipe dream. So instead, um, that's kind of where I ended up dragging out risk five. So I said, all right, what I could do is if I'm limited in my web environment, I could figure out how to get risk five to run in JavaScript. And if I can get that happening, then we can start figuring out how to take some sort of C compiler and get it to run because there's a lot of stuff that can run on top of risk five, which is not available for JavaScript. So this would effectively like open up the Holy grail. <laughs> so, um, that's kind of, yeah. Um, Stu Pack, I was trying to get something that does not involve in installing anything and is definitely not tied to any sort of licensing restrictions. And by the way, if you think that visual studio is free, it's not. It is free for certain limited use, <laughs> but it is not something that is, it, it, it has its caveats and it its limitations. And I did not want to go down the path of like dealing with like Microsoft not being interested in, you know, the, the sharing screen, you know, scenario. So instead I said, all right, why don't we stick with stuff that's actually open instead of things that are closed? And I don't want things that involve like, you know, some long registration process and, you know, it, I mean, at the moment, we're using Discord for authentication, and that seems to be about the right level because people who are using Discord are, you know, able to connect on voice on stream. Okay, so yeah, that was kind of the the general idea. So we're not going to get that far today, <laughs> um, but what we are going to do, um, in order to kind of go down this path, I found a off the shelf C compiler which is called Selfie. And Selfie is designed to not only run on RISC-V and emit RISC-V instructions, so it can output like an object file, which is RISC-V, um, but it also is self-hosting. So you can take that thing and run it on its own little hypervisor. So, you know, this is, um, I think they call it hipster. <laughs> um, and they also have this MIPster piece and, you know, there's, there's there's a bunch of stuff here. So I thought, OK, well, great. Let's just get going with Selfie. So if we can just get Selfie to run on top of this, then we're good to go because it can compile, it can compile all those things. Well, yeah, <laughs> because life is hard. Um, there's trouble when you try to take this thing and get it to run straight in WASM. And that's that's kind of where we're going to begin our journey. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, and uh, that <laughs> that it turns out that selfie really what I what I kind of missed in the intro docs is that selfie really is a 64-bit only thing, and Wasm 64 is not available in LLVM. So you know, strike two, guy. <laughs> so this is kind of just it just kept getting more and more fun uh, when I was trying to get last week's show going. So I said, okay, well, if we can't do that, <laughs> then um, maybe we can just extract the C part of this and we can emit JS directly. Well, that's that's a big project because this thing is you know not designed to do exactly that. So so there's a bit of work there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where we're gonna start. So I thought, like, well, let, let's begin this. Let's let's begin this journey. Okay, so that's our setup. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's where things started to get interesting. So um, yeah, I'm gonna cut back over here, and what I'm showing you here, this um, I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead of myself, but. This is, um, let, me, let, let, me, let me skip over. This is actually the learning environment that I created. And this is currently borrowing server resources. So this is doing something similar to what a bunch of the other um, environments are doing. And we actually, I mean, the goal, the first goal was really to just get like off the ground and start teaching C as soon as possible. So this this did that. Okay, we, we, we managed to um, build a version of this that, you know, 
it takes C. This is a shared editor, so as I'm typing and streaming, uh, the other person is able to see it. We're both in the same voice channel. Eventually, we'll figure out how to put some video up here. Um, and we have a shared whiteboard, and the output is shared. So this is um, this was kind of like you know where I got started with all of that fun. Um, so then I said, well, all right, let's let's go pull out Risk Five. So Risk Five, you know, I thought, well, all right. Before we get to building our own stuff, let's use something kind of off the shelf, you know, because that would be really nice. <laughs> so what did I do? I started with, um, you know, well, here we're, we're just in our normal learning. And I already apologize to those of you who missed it in the intro, but, you know, I am going to be borrowing heavily from pre-written code today. So everything here will not be live. <laughs> and let me show you why. Because some of this stuff takes a while to run. So if we wanted to start with um, scripting, the first thing we do is we clone it. All right, great, that works pretty fast. Um, while we're working with Inscripton, we can you know, then pull it into our environment. So if we do that, then we're gonna end up with this EMCC wonder um, stuff. But before we can do that, uh, we have to first install the particular tool chain. So um, this is the EM SDK, and I'm going to need uh, the latest version of this that's compiled. Now keep in mind, we're running Mscripten on x86-64. So my machine is, you know, normal Intel, you know, 64-bit machine. And this is pulling down a cross tool chain, which is designed, which sits on top of LLVM, which basically is going to take you know, whatever programs I write, run on x86-64 and, tr and output code that's gonna be WASM so that I can run it over here on the browser. So that's kind of where, oh, and Stupak, thank you for the sub, I appreciate it. Um, so that, that was, you know, kind of where things got started. <laughs> and as you can see, like most commands that are going to be involved today, like this, this stuff doesn't happen instantly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's one of our challenges. So once we have this latest thing, we're going to just activate it for, um, oh, sorry, uh, I gave it two conflicting commands there. So um, I want to activate the latest um, tool chain that I just installed. Okay, great. Now I have a version of this that actually runs um, which can produce um, WASM, which is which is cool. I can I can go and I can run um, their examples, but I need to pull in um, their. Uh, this is yeah. I need I need to pull in their environment. So we need to override so that if we go running this thing, like it actually kind of runs correctly. So we pull that guy in, and we're good to go. All right, wonderful. Now we're ready to start compiling stuff. So if we go here and, you know, we write a very simple C program, like, you know, I'm just going to, and we'll use this for a bunch of our samples. So this is um, not going to be particularly interesting. Uh, we're just going to take SCDIO and we're going to print like a very simple, like, hello, Stupak you know, for our stream. So all right, not a very complicated C program, but you know, it enough to like kind of get us off the ground. All right, so if we run emcc, which is now in my path, and I compile this C thing, then I end up also realizing that they need a bunch of support libraries, so you know, it lazy loads and it starts pulling all this stuff down or creating it. All right, we're good to go. We look and we end up with, you know, our test file. Um, our a dot out. So this, they literally stick to the conventions of, you know, <laughs> if you compile something and you don't specify what the output file is, then it's a, it's the assembler output. So there's my little JavaScript stub. So I can go and look at it. And, you know, this is a, just enough of JavaScript to load my WASM stub, which is binary-ish. <laughs> so, um, that's cool. Um, I can actually go and, you know, if I wanted to get a little bit fancy, I guess I could I could turn this, um, and Scripton is kind of nice because it'll actually host your application in a web page. So if I go and I look at um, this uh, test HTML, then this will actually build just enough of a web page that I can see my application running. So that I don't have to worry too much about building the UI that's gonna be there. So I, I can actually, you know, 
do this. Um, so, yeah, we're going to need... Uh, uh, let me just shut this off real quick. And let's do... Yeah. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, so if we go here and we take a look at what I created, then here's all my little uh, mscriptum files, and I've got this test HTML, which gives me hello, Stupac. All right, great. We know how to use mscriptum. Now, why is this cool? Because here I'm actually, I wrote a printf, right? I'm using C library, C calling convention. It's compiling it, and it's turning it into WebAssembly. That's great. That's WebAssembly 32-bit. Um, which you know is where we're going to hit the problem momentarily. Okay, so there I was Thursday thinking, wow, and scriptum works really well. So let's just go and uh, pull down selfie, you know, and let's let's get a copy of selfie, which is going to be our self-hosting C compiler, which can output its own uh, Risk Five instructions. So we take this thing and we try building it. So this basically has just a normal make file and it uses just whatever your C compiler is set to so you can set your C compiler to whatever you want. So I'll set it to mscriptum which is currently in my path and I'll make this thing. Now it's it's just a single file but you're gonna notice a bug report <laughs> which is where things started to get fun. <laughs> so and it really wants me it says please attach the following files. All right we're not filing the bug report right now. Um, and if we go back through this whole error thing, what we're going to realize is this line over here. So 64-bit WebAssembly, no. <laughs> um, that's problematic because Selfie requires 64-bit alignment because it's, it's by default emitting RV64, so that's RISC-V 64-bit. Uh, so we can, we can go mucking around with the compiler a little bit. You know, we can, we can, we can edit this thing. And uh, yeah, this is this is where we start the uh oh journey, um, Stupac. So you know, let's let, let's take our C flags and let's you know let's kind of bump this around a little bit. Let's 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 get rid of the optimizations that are here. Let's let's get rid of this extra junk. Let's 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 get rid of the 64 bit. And instead of forcing uint 64t to a 64 bit data type, let's. Let's make it a 32 bit data type. All right, so sounds good. The compiler should do some magic and maybe it'll all fit in and you know, we're good to go. Well, no, <laughs> because already we're overflowing things, but you know, it generates, you know, so now I have this version of selfie, which um, is web assembly. <laughs> I got it to compile, but um, yeah, it's requiring four gigs of memory. So we can go down the path of trying to modify Selfie, and that's, I'm not going to bore you with the details. I, I spent a lot of time trying to do that Thursday night. And it, it, you know, after stubbing out a bunch of system calls because it's counting on a little minimal kernel, like it wants to have open, you know, if you look in the Selfie code, you'll see um, that there's, you know, there's an open call, open with a parenthesis. Okay, so there's an open call, there's a malloc call, there's a read and a write. So first you'd have to go and stub all these out because we don't, we're not running with a kernel if we're running on the web. <laughs> um, yeah, so I went down that path and then, you know, then you have to change all these types because they all require 64 and then, you know, bad things happen when it tries to hit a function that's not there. And anyway, there went my Thursday <laughs> into Friday. So yeah, um, Stu Pack, I didn't either. <laughs> it's, it's the moral of the story there. <laughs> okay, so great. That didn't work. So now we need to get ourselves, before I went any further, I said, well, why don't we try to figure out how to run Risk V on the internet? Okay, and, and this is kind of where, um, you know, things started to get very interesting. So I'm just going to throw this glove back on because, you know, attempt one here ended up not working too well. So, all right, well, let's clear our minds. So this, oops, sorry. Um, this is, you know, now that we're here, I wanna, I wanna switch, we're gonna go to another color space because this is just, this is a totally different world. All right, so what do we learn? Well, mscripten, with 
you know, <laughs> WASM 64, no dice. Uh, and the goal there was to get the selfie C compiler, you know, somehow running, you know, in a web app. All right, well, we tried that and we learned that doesn't work. Um, we can spend a bit of time trying to relax this constraint. We can spend a bunch of time trying to get this to work without a kernel. We can do all sorts of other things. I ended up not going down that path. I said, well, what's option B? All right, well, option B. <laughs> what is option B, you ask? Well, let's not count on this. Okay, so let's, let, let's stay away from WASM 64. Let's let let let's switch gears for a minute and get back to what we were, you know, originally trying to focus on, which was, you know, the C compiler because that's what we needed for class. And of course, I wasn't going to miss an opportunity to completely over-engineer something. So I said, well, let's take step three and find an off-the-shelf RISC-V core, which um, you know will will host Selfie because I can get Selfie to compile to RISC-V. Um, not WASM64, but I can get it to run RV64. Now, at this point, I didn't realize this bit constraint, but you might, <laughs> you, the observant viewer, might already know. <laughs> um, so, well, I went and I found, like, you know, there's a couple um, off the shelf things. There's, there's the Angel emulator, there's um, some other Berkeley projects, you know, there's, you know, that Berkeley, not Berkeley, the, the music school. Um, there's, um, and these things, and then there's kind of like full blown like JS Linux. And, you know, this, this seemed like a bit extreme just to get a C compiler, but you know, it'll work, but it'll be very slow. <laughs> so I didn't want to start there if we could avoid it. And I knew that later on I was going to be spending time with RISC-V anyway for the FPGA stuff. So I said, well, why don't we invest a little bit? So what are we going to invest in? Well, how hard is it to get this thing to actually work on the internet? Well, and that's kind of where we went down <laughs> the path. So, so this, this, this like off the shelf path ends up not working. How hard is it to get this to run on the internet? Well, all you got to do is build a CPU. So, you know, we have our wires and, you know, we just take that and we put it on top of JavaScript and because of the magic of diagrams, we're done. <laughs> well, this doesn't work too well. So um, in order to actually do this, I picked a minimal version of RISC-V. So like I said, RISC-V has all sorts of variants. Um, I'm going to take a 32-bit version of it, which has only the integer extension, which is just I. So none of the other stuff, if I can avoid it. So the atomics, the multiplier, you know, divider, the floating point, the vector stuff, you know, no. Okay, we're, we're going to go for like, just let the C compiler worry about how it's going to assemble it. What, what minimum part of RISC-V do I need to get this working? And we're going to get rid of compression. So we don't want any compressed opcodes. So every opcode should be a full 32 bits. All right. So if I come here and I get my bits right, you know, so this is happening at bit seven and this is bit zero and you know, this is bit 15 and this is bit 23. And by the way, I was off all sorts of ones as I was moving <laughs> through this <laughs> over the weekend. But um, so uh, no, Cam, I haven't actually seen that. Uh, so this, if I can get every one of these opcodes to be exactly the same size, then I don't need to worry too much. It won't be too hard to take every instruction so this is a full instruction is going to be 32 bits. All right. So it, it you know, looks like a normal, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight kind of number. Um, so this corresponds, this is the hex representation of these. And we can actually go and, you know, look and decode this instruction and, you know, see if we can, you know, disassemble it. If we can disassemble it, eventually we could get around to interpreting it. So this is, you know, exactly where I move to next. <laughs> so whenever I get an instruction coming in on the CPU, there's a couple steps that the CPU does. The first is it decodes the instruction. So it says, all right, what 
what instruction is this? You know, it's like, okay, is this a load? <laughs> um, so that's the job of the decoder. So I said, let's, let's build a decoder first. Um, then it goes, all right, what are my operands? You know, so this is like what, what arguments are being passed along for this particular instruction. That's also part of the decoder. So I should really write this as like, you know, we'll call this 1.2. <laughs> we'll call this 1.1. Um, and then we actually have the job of, you know, running the instruction. So this is like, you know, execute. So this, this is, you know, sometimes called, oops, my bad, execute. Um, and they call this sometimes retiring the instruction. So, you know, whatever needs to happen to actually finish this thing, like, you know, so like take this and add it to this or, you know, whatever the instruction does, like actually go and run it. So this is kind of emulation. So we're not gonna worry about this right now. We're really gonna worry about this segment for now. Okay, great. And hey, what's up, Denzel? How are you doing, dude? Pro gamer. <laughs> um, Great, so sounds easy, right? Well, I went and pulled up, um, this by the way, I ended up, and I don't generally print things out, but this is a printout of all of the instructions that are available, and it's nice that it fits onto one page, and you can all see it right here, because I have it here for you. So these are all of the instructions that we're gonna need in order to be able to run Risk Five. So it's, it's this stuff over here. I think they say there's like 40 something, but in reality, a bunch of these instructions, you don't need to emulate for simple purposes because like, you know, fence, for example, is related to like, you know, coordinating multiple processor hearts and we're only gonna go with one processor, you know, and there's a whole bunch of CSR instructions we're not gonna need because, you know, I don't, we don't, we don't really care about getting our metrics right and all this other stuff. Um, yeah, Denzel, this is, uh, we're, this is actually about um, learning, uh, building a learning tool to do uh, C compiling. So this is, uh, you know, this is kind of like the, the gold here. It would be, you know, be able to do C on the web and run it somewhere. And so that's where I sort of ended up breaking out into RISC-V. So I said, this is a minimal computer we can get to work in time. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, that's definitely annoying, Stupak. <laughs> uh, so I ended up opening up this manual. And this thing is the most recent version that seemed to be standardized. This is version 2.2 and it's long. <laughs> so um, we're going to cover all of it on this stream. No, 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 we're not going to do that. But what that's where like, you know, if we jump down to a few you know pages that I sort of extracted just so that we could quickly look at them, um, this is the basics of every one of those instructions fits one of these formats, this R-I-S-U-J. B stuff, um, and that basically just says, okay, the opcode, like this is the format for that particular instruction. So for a J type, which is really simple, we have an opcode which says that this is a jump kind of thing. And we have RD and immediate, which are the two fields, all of them have this RD, um, um, which is usually, typically the destination. Um, so in this case, I think it's where we're gonna go next. And this, which is, um, used as an argument. So this this is actually the address here. Um, and that that's, I was just describing the JAL instruction, which actually is kind of where I started to have a little bit of fun because they said, um, when I read in the doc, they said, well, don't worry because in the latest version of JAL and JTYPE instructions, we managed to get rid of them because there used to be this jump instruction and now we're using U-type formatting. So there is no more J-type format. This removes the J-type instruction format from the base ISA. I thought that was great until I went and I looked at the <laughs> particular stuff related to understanding this JAL instruction, which is, yeah, this is, this is actually the piece that I just kind of clipped for you. Um, so this JAL instruction, which gets talked about a little bit further down. And this manual is pretty big. Well, it turns out <laughs> this still uses J-type form. <laughs> so there, there were a few um, gotchas as I was implementing this and it's a work in progress. I don't think anybody's been doing the 32-bit version recently. I don't, I don't know how much focus there's been on that. I think most of it's on the 64-bit, but um, yeah, <laughs> managed to catch our first bug. So, 
Well, do you want to see it? Because that's kind of what comes next. So I ended up um, saying, well, let's look at everything. Thank you, Stupak. <laughs> let's look at everything that is going to be coming. And I thought this was going to be relatively easy. It turned out it was way harder than I thought it was going to be. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to pull in uh, the version of it that I ended up building. Um, so this is the decoder. All right. So if I go and I drop this thing in here. Oh, look, magically, I typed up this whole massive file that's uh, 420 lines, and I got it right the first time I did it. <laughs> so this is this is it. Um, and just to give you a sense of the kind of things that was going on, I was not trying to do optimizations. You know, I was just trying to get something good enough for the Friday show originally, and then I realized this was way bigger than what I thought. And these masks, um, turns out, you know, in JavaScript, you can work directly with binary numbers. <laughs> so you just put a zero B in front of it and shifts work, except this triple greater than because I wasn't sure what was happening in JavaScript when it was making my numbers negative and well it turns out unsigned and types in JavaScript so <laughs> I knew that I was getting myself in for trouble so um, as I went through this you know basically the idea was um, here's the actual decoder okay so if I take this decoder and you know I feed it a place where it can stick its output and I give it a binary and I'm going to get a little bit more into that later, but um, and we feed it these RV32 integer instructions, you know, so just that minimal instruction set that I sort of showed you uh, before. So that's that's this guy. Um, then everything there should be four hex digits at a time. So you know, I'd better get an even multiple of four, otherwise, you know, you're sending me an incomplete program. <laughs> um, so we go and we start taking the thing apart, and basically. If we pull the last seven bits off the number, and I did that, you know, basically I just said, all right, here's the last seven bits. And if I and it with that, then I end up pulling it off um, the instruction that just came in. Um, by the way, this is the full instruction. All I did was I just put it in the right byte order here. So, you know, the, the first, you know, the, the, the first hex digits are, you know, all the way on the left, and then the last ones are over on the right. So the thing on the right is the least significant, and the thing, you know, so, you know, Indianness and all that fun. Um, I wanted to be operating in JavaScript, so I put it into the right format up here. And we also get out the hex of what we're going to, you know, what it's going to, what was passed to it. So that's instruction by instruction what I'm getting. All right, well, we take this thing and we want to pull the uh, last seven bits off it because that's the opcode. So if I look on this column, I thought, well, great, I can just look up exactly what the code is and then I'll know which of these instructions you know, is being run. And it should be that simple. I'll be done in like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, everything was as simple as I thought for this episode. <laughs> so um, this is... Uh, yeah, it turns out a bunch of these instructions, they have exactly the same opcode. So like if you look down here at like e call and ebreak, you know, you'll notice they're exactly the same. How do you tell them apart? Well, it turns out you have to look over here. So the instruction set is not like completely one to one with these opcodes. It turns out part of the opcode is actually hiding in the rest of the registers. And they did that to save space and managed to get a pretty big instruction set into and leave room for expansion. But boy, <laughs> that was hard. Yes. Yes, Denzel. Sorry about that. This is a rough episode to come into first. But um yeah, so you know I started off like, oh yeah, look here, I got the LUI instruction. We're all good to go. It just looks like that. All right. And then if it looks like this, then I've got the AUI PC instruction. All right. So that was kind of the beginning of my decoder. Then I realized like a whole bunch of these shared the same opcode, you know, like these these branches here. Um, and they use these other bits over here, which are referred to as func three, func three. Um, and that's how you can sort of dis you know, disambiguate those. Well, 
all right, fine. So I started getting these groups and then things got a little bit crazier. And then I did the same thing with these guys, except, you know, some of it turns out there's holes, you know, like this bad here, you know, you don't want to see bad because that's not a valid instruction. Um, this 011, it would be. Um, I left notes about what was what because I kept being off by one. And when you're on binary and you're off by one, you got a lot of trouble. <laughs> so um, yeah, so here's all the loads. They use the L type. Well, it's not called L type. <laughs> they use these types. Um, and uh, then there's the, the stores and then here's the ads and then there's ads and math math stuff at and then there's the version of that if it has a parameter in memory and then anyway long story short you take all that you package it all up and you put it into a web app and well i actually left my test harness down here at the bottom so if you actually compile a very basic program and base 64 it then you get your static program over here and you can go read this binary file and you can tell it to decode and it'll in the case of node, it'll drop it on console. So that's neat. Um, I uncomment this and that'll work in theory. So yeah, let's um, let me just make sure I save that. Okay, yeah, I did. So we can actually just run that and it's gonna go looking because I left it looking for Linux. Um, so let's, you know, Let's turn that off. <laughs> and uh, see, you are gonna get some code today. Um, and what I did with this, you know, I'm just gonna pull one of these um, static programs. I'm gonna take it from base64. I'm gonna turn it back into normal binary. I'm gonna get my compiled bin, and then I'm gonna decode it. Okay, run it, and voila. <laughs> so this is kind of what you get through all of that um, <laughs> suffering I thought was going to be just a really quick thing ready for a show. <laughs> and so, um, and here I'm showing you kind of what I was showing you before on the whiteboard or as Nightshade Dude likes to say, the blackboard. And that has, this is the actual instruction that's passed in. So this is 32 bits wide. Um, the opcode is down here and then the rest of the opcode and the arguments are over here. And here I've turned it back into like a normal mnemonic, you know, something that we can read as opposed to something the machine reads. Um, so here I've got an add i, and it's it's an i type instruction. So if I go to my chart, I'll see, okay, that's this line. So in order to decode that, you need to look for rd and rs1 and immediate. Now, add i actually adds whatever is in immediate to whichever register you select, and it stores the result in rd. So that's kind of the semantics, but... Um, what does it end up doing? Well, it stores it in register two, and this just says that it's an add because you know a bunch of them use the same opcode, and it's taking register two and it's adding negative thirty-two, and that's where my next set of bugs were because negative numbers are very large. You have to two's complement, and it doesn't work with just the JavaScript syntax. So, um, yes, you're welcome, Nightshade dude. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the detail of that because this this ended up being like crazy. But the moral of the story is that you take all of this code that I just showed you and oh, already editing it. So let's go back to the right terminal. And you end up with uh, something that, you know, and this is the reason why I injected console log because I wanted to be able to use it at the command prompt or I wanted to be able to use it in a web application. So that's why I added a little bit of thin um, stuff. And I figured like if I could upload a binary and let the web application decode it, that would be pretty good because that then I could test that this is working and then we can move on to the next stage of actually, you know, virtualizing a whole CPU. Okay, so yeah, this hardware is kind of interesting. I mean, it's like, it. it it's it was a different mindset, so it took a little bit to kind of switch over here. But um, this is actually the web app that I rolled. So exactly the same type of output that you saw before, except now I've gone and uploaded an entire Linux kernel. Okay, so that's a pretty good torture test for this entire thing, and it ended up working nicely, <laughs> which kind of surprised me. But um, Let's let's actually go through some steps to actually get there. Now, we want this. Uh, yeah, 
let me just put this app back up. So this is the disassembler. And let's just reset, no, go away. Let's reset this thing. Okay, so it's running here, it's waiting for you to upload a file. All right, great. Well, through the magic of tool chains, um, which uh, ended up being more interesting because um, what you really want to do if you, if you go and you compile this thing like let's 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 go back to our simple C example again um, so you know actually oh sorry I have it in my uh, Mscripten directory so let's just copy it from Mscripten we had our test.c and we're gonna put that in this directory all right so not much going on in this program now I definitely don't have this, right, this this printf. So let's just reduce the complexity of this a little bit. Um, so I'm not gonna include stdio. I'm not gonna print anything out. I'm just gonna do something simple like, let's set um, variable i equal to, let's see, who has a number in their username? StuPack does 62. Okay, so let's set i to 62, and then let's do something like i is gonna get i plus, 17. Or actually, let's pick something smaller. Let's do i plus 7. Okay, simple C program. I go and I compile it. Yeah, it compiles fine, right? There's my A out. I run it. Yeah, it runs fine. Okay, there's no output on it. But what did I just do that's wrong? This is x86-64. Okay, that's not my risk 5 that I emulate. I didn't emulate x86-64. I emulated risk 5. So, I need to compile this thing for risk five. Now, with a lot of work, um, you can actually go and create your own tool chain. And I'm not going to show you how to do that right now, but um, it is something that I'll actually, I'll post it in uh, Discord for anybody who wants to. But um, it turns out, like I originally tried to create this as an RV32i tool chain. Um, it turns out glibc requires atomics, which is really funny because atomics um, so atomic operators are basically like if you have like four processors running something you want to be able to say like this processor wait wait for all these you know before you like change anything like you're not allowed to change this between when I pull it from memory and when I'm like calculating it and putting it back into memory like so there's sort of like blocks so that you you don't trip over yourselves with multiple cores but I'm only emulating a single core so I didn't need atomics, but glibc requires them. So first I built the tool chain, then I built the tool chain again, and then I built the tool chain for today. And then I tried the off the shelf one, which created risk 64. And then anyway, lots of fun later, which, um, and hey, what's up Panos, how you doing? Um, no, uh, Denzel, you to call it with a switch. So like, you know, there is an MARC switch. Um, GCC has to have the ability to generate that instruction set. So if I, if I, this version of GCC only has x86-64, it, typically GCC only has whatever platform you're running on. So this GCC, if I'm running on, you know, oh, sorry. If I'm running on a x86-64 and I'm compiling on it, I'm compiling for x86-64. I'm, I'm sort of one-to-one, -one. you know, I'm emitting instructions for the, for the platform that I'm running on. But I want to go cross, more like the Mscripten case. I want to run the compiler on x86-64, but I want to generate for RISC-V. So that's cross-compiling. Um, and the cross-compiler is not built into GCC. I mean, I guess you could build a mega GCC that has every target in it, but that thing might be kind of slow <laughs> and crazy. But um, So that's what these are over here. So if you, if you look in these directories, you'll actually see like this is basically just GCC that's created for a particular target. So in this case, it's I didn't want elf headers because you know I'd have to parse elf and do some other stuff. Um, so this is um, this is actually a 32-bit version. So this is unlike the tools that I downloaded, which all wanted to be 64, but it will run on x86-64. So if I go and I look at this thing, This program itself is x86-64, but it's going to emit risk 5 which is what I want. <laughs> uh, no, it cross-compiling, uh, no, it's not built in for targets. Um, your, your Netflix is showing because uh, we almost always have ARM targets built into our GCC. <laughs> um, yeah, sure, Panos, why don't you send it to the Discord? <laughs> 
um, unless it's really short and you think you could fit it into the stream. <laughs> um, all right, so I can run this thing and run it against my little test program, which is could be the poem. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. All right, yeah, go ahead, Panos. So, no, dude, <laughs> no, no bad. Come on, man. <laughs> let's 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 keep things PG here. So, I don't know. Can you do that? I don't want to ban you. You're all right. Can I just uh, get rid of that message? No, that's going to mod you instead. <laughs> that's all right. Let me time that out. All right. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Um, OK, so we go and uh, we come back here and before the poem <laughs> and we do this uh, this cross compiler that we just created painstakingly. Oh, except this is the wrong directory. I want the RV32. This one was an off the shelf one, but it was, it ha it was generating instructions for like multiply and other things that I didn't want. Um, so that bin this thing and you know, we'll do some GCC. Sound good? Okay, that compiles fine. And if I look at the output, I'll see that this thing was 32-bit, um, and it was it's packed in the right format for RISC-V, and this should be following kind of the convention that I want. Now, the downside with this thing, if I just try to use this file directly, um, which... Uh, it's over here somewhere. Oh yeah, it doesn't like to see my app directory for reasons. So I'm just gonna <laughs> hacky work around is I'll just um, I'll put this in the download directory for us. So yeah, there's there's some security thing about that. So if I if I do this thing, then I'm gonna realize that it has an elf header. Okay, so um, that's not part of the risk five stuff. Elf headers are about like putting the thing into the right location in memory, linking, you know, intermediate results. We don't want that. We're talking about raw code. I want to see the raw code, which is from this particular file. All right. Well, that's fine because there's another tool that I can use from the tool chain, which is called object copy. And what I can do is I can say, give me the, just the binary from this file. Um, disregard the elf headers and all the other stuff and dump that thing in this binary file. Now, because I have to work around that uh, <laughs> path issue, I can go and load this just binary version of it. And there we go. So if I look, GCC has gone yeah, it runs. <laughs> so um, we're getting a whole lot more code here than, um, and this is, well, I mean, this is actually just a whole bunch of zeros. So um, this is padding. This has to do with how you link the particular thing, but it's also adding in like some start and some like typical C stuff for main, which I don't really want. So if I want to get rid of all that, <laughs> um, I have to tell, GCC like, okay, don't compile using that stuff. So, and this kind of gets into some of the architecture flags that um, Denzel mentioned earlier. Um, so in this case, we just need to, um, yeah, basically take this thing and we need, to, we need to spell out how to link it because right now GCC is adding a whole bunch of memory um, which would be mapped into RAM on load. And, you know, I, we have to specify like, you know, a, a template for how to do this. And I'm going to take um, I'm going to take a pre-made template uh, that I did over here, which is bare metal. Okay, so we're going to take our bare metal layout and we're going to put it back into this app directory. 
So, yeah, this bare metal thing, this is a linker template. So this basically is telling GCC like, okay, I want you to put the code starting at address 200. I want you to like text is the, the actual program text, you know, with the old terminology for it. It's not text like you can read, you know, it's just the, the program itself. Any variables and data stuff we're gonna put after it, and then we're gonna specify that that's the end of the thing. So it's going to link it up, and it's gonna put an elf header that matches this format. So, great. All we gotta do is compile that. So I'm going to give you a pretty big gnarly command. So let's take our, not this, let's take our GCC command. And let's walk through a few things. So first, we're going to spell out that we only want instructions that are coming from, you know, the 32i set. So I don't want any other atomics. I don't want any, like, other vectors or multiplies or anything else. Um, then I want to take that and I want to specify the calling format. So this is my ABI, and I want to use the standard ILP32. And I don't want any start files. So this is like kind of like normally when a program is starting up, it, it, it initializes a bunch of stuff about the environment. So we don't want any of that. Now, I'm not going to walk you through these other parameters, but they basically just say, like, don't include anything. OK, so um, use this linker layout that I just copied over, so this bare metal layout. Get rid of the debugging stuff and you know put the actual resulting map over here in this file you know, with the references and make this thing so that it can just stand on its own. It's not a program that needs to be run by an operating system. It's something that can just be run by itself, like its own kernel directly on the hardware. Um, now we have to add in all the functionality to make that work, but I mean that basically tells GCC like don't add all that other stuff and don't include the standard library. Great, I get all that done which I get a new version of this AI. Now, this guy will match. If I look at that firmware map, this will show me what it actually did. And it should follow what I just told it to do, which actually this did. Um, it's going to, you know, put the text, you know, it's going to jump ahead, like, you know, to address 200, it's going to put the text over there, then the data segment. And this is all pretty much matches the bare metal layout. So that's, um, you know, GCC works. <laughs> um, so great. Now I want to strip all of these other sections out, you know, so like, you know, this BSS and this, this data and, you know, all these other segments. And that's basically the object copy that I was just running. So let's just do that again and we'll get rid of the elf header. And now if I copy this thing over to my downloads, so that I can upload it to this. Oh, and this tool has a little gotcha. If the, if the file name is called the same thing, then you know bad stuff happens. Okay, so let's just reload this. And now we get the program we're expecting. Okay, so here, these instructions are about setting up the stack. That's just GCC initializing some memory so that we, can, we have a place to store the variables. In this case, I think the variable was I. <laughs> so we're going to leave some room. Um, and this, by the way, threw me off. I was like, why is it going negative on the first instruction? Because I kept linking it so that it would start at zero and it tried to go back below zero and bad things happen. <laughs> so that's why you want to move it to like 200 and leave yourself a little bit of room to operate. Um, great. Well, then I'm going to see like, you know, now this stuff will have, um, so here's the 62 that I was just initializing it to. Um, so it's actually going to add, there is no like move operator. Like normally you would just like in, in Intel world, you would just move the 62 into the right register. They got rid of that to keep the implementation minimal on risk five. So they're just going to take this 62 and they're going to stick it into register 15. Then what they're going to do is they're going to store register 15 into memory location minus 20 from where we are. So that's going to be up above in that initialized space. And then we're going to do our little add that we just said. So I said add 7 to it. So i is i plus 7. Well, that maps to this 7 is going to be added to register 15. And we're going to stick the result in register 15, which is fine because we're overwriting i. And then we're going to store that in the memory. So 
There it is. <laughs> so for a little bit of extra credit fun, so I hope that part made some sense. Basically, this is the disassembly um, in pure JavaScript of this um, program that we just compiled and stripped all the other stuff out, which you normally get on operating system. Um, I could leave the hello stew pack. This would actually sit in a part of memory, which I was just stripping out. That's down below. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep things simple because we have one last thing we need to go through, which is just before we got going, I said, hey, wouldn't it be cool in addition to, you know, having the specs so that we can fully implement this thing and, you know, we learned that Selfie wasn't going to kind of get us there. What if we took Linux, all of Linux, and compiled it with this tool chain to just be able to fit into these opcodes. So this theoretically is a pretty good torture test. And that's actually what we were kind of sneaking a peek at before. So you basically, this is just a recent Linux I just downloaded and I configured it for RISC-V and you know that I'm gonna, here, let me just copy out this kernel because we don't wanna watch the whole thing compile. But um, yeah, we could actually take, um, this is the minimum config that you could use to build a RISC-V kernel. So this is basically just saying, all right, architecture is RISC-V and you know, clean up your configs and all that stuff. And we're gonna go with the tiny, like minimal sort of config um, of Linux. So this has just as little as possible, but you know, will run Linux. So we do that. And this, this part actually is not too bad. This, this goes pretty quick, but there's a problem. Normally I would just go into the menu config and set like whatever you know parameters I want. They don't work. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but I ended up just manually, this, you shouldn't do this at home. But despite what I said, it will try to build a 64-bit version of this kernel, which is not what we want. So we're gonna want this config arch, RV32Is, yes. And of course that invalidates a bunch of other parameters because you know they, they depend on each other. And you know, we also are gonna need like, you know, a bunch of other stuff which I'm not gonna show you. <laughs> um, it's basically these are if you're if you're curious, just for completeness, this is what else I messed around with, which was that, you know, don't disable compressed instructions because we want every instruction to be four bytes. Um, and no FPU. So I don't want any of the math instructions other than just the ads, you know, the, the stuff that's in the base instruction set. So we do all that and then we go and we actually, you know, make this thing. And we remember that we have to <laughs> specify the architecture. I killed myself on this a bunch of times when I was doing it. <laughs> but, um, and here I'm just saying, you know, do some parallelization while you do it. And it's going to ask you a few questions for things that are now kind of crazy. And I basically just took defaults for everything else. So we're just going to go defaults. That's where you saw the FPU support, which just shot by. Sorry about that. Um, and the compressed stuff. So, you know, we do a whole bunch of things here. And it starts compiling. Except, you know, of course, you can't do that <laughs> in its current state. So, um, this is like a much longer show than I really want to get into. But basically, after you spend a lot of time cleaning all that up, you end up with this thing, um, this this version of the Linux kernel, which is actually created for 32-bit architecture, does actually work on RISC-V, and again, has an ELF header. So we can take this thing and using that same... Um, technique. So I'm just going to copy that kernel back over here. So let's copy VM Linux over to apps. Uh, so this was, this is episode five because risk five. And um, so now we have it over here and we want to just pull out, you know, that one part and we want to make a binary, you know, so to take the VM Linux thing, strip it all out and just end up with this VM Linux dot bin. Okay, so if I look at this, if I look at VM Linux, it recognizes it as an ELF header and it sees all this stuff. But if I look at the binary, it doesn't know what it is because it just shows up as data. There's no, there's no file headers. There's not, it's just raw code that's running there. All right, so I use, do my little hack work around for the browser, copy that into my downloads directory, pull this up. There's my bin. 
decoder. <laughs> Stew pack, it was way more time than I was hoping for for a weekly show. <laughs> I can tell you that much. Um, and you know, there's some zero padding. There's some data stuff down here at the bottom. Uh, we're not really worried about that because this actually works. So um, this decoder is as far as I got the decoder. Some of these parameters aren't, I didn't finish decoding all the parameters for the show. Like, you know, I think this one, and, um, but you know, and then I trapped a few that weren't showing up. So uh, it does take quite a while to get to one that I think, yeah, that unknown, those are those are mostly no ops when you see the unknown, but this this particular trap, um, so that's that's something that it wants to implement. So this is emitting some code which is not in that base set that I that I got. Okay, so yes, Stupak. Um, the long story short is the the plan is to open source this when it's kind of farther, you know, like like this. Um, where it's at right now, we've got a good chunk of a disassembler written. I can't say how much of it because I haven't finished and I don't, and I won't know until I'm done. Um, but the goal is that when this is at least able to kind of get through a full Linux kernel kind of program, then I will push this up. So that'll be um, something that we're gonna come back to in future editions. So that's, um, yeah, and we're gonna use it, by the way, this is gonna be the same um, host tools that we're gonna use uh, to run on the FPGA later. So that'll be fun later on in the season. So anyway, um, sorry it doesn't fit the normal set of shows where we get to just write something, but you know this ended up being ridiculously more complicated than I thought it was going to be. But um, I felt pretty good. I mean, just case study wise, I think it's I think it's interesting if you're ever getting into computer architecture stuff. I mean, the whole stream that we're doing is about C, you know, and learning C. Um, that's so I've got two students now running on Mondays. There's one that's learning Python from scratch, and one who's a Python programmer is learning C. And she was commenting that um, yeah, C's really giving her a better sense of what it's like in terms of the metal. But I mean, this is really and and that's true. Coming from Python, C is basically the metal. But um, going from there, from C, this is literally the metal. Like, I mean, these instructions are what are being written. So it's funny that the tool that's going to help teach, you know, for teaching for her is <laughs> written down to that level. So um, I think if we get a little bit further, I'll probably, you know, I'll finish the disassembler first. Maybe we'll add an assembler. I don't know if, if that's necessary um, because I think it'd be more fun to build an interpreter. You know, maybe we'll see if we can actually run programs on the web um, and basically without WASM and without anything. Um, I, I, I don't know how far away it is from here, so I don't want to make any promises, but um, this is just what I had in the schedule at this point. Yeah, this is a different level. I, I, I do apologize for that. Um, I, I had a really nice show originally where I was like, okay, now we're going to like take the C thing and we're going to do WASM and we're going to have selfie compile it and then it's going to be on the web. That didn't work <laughs> for all the reasons we talked about before. but. Um, so I wanted to stick with the schedule. I didn't want to like go, this is, I guess, the problem with publishing the schedule ahead of time. So for those of you who are new to the stream, um, I did, and that's the curriculum there, but I did actually show, this is this is kind of the schedule. So um, I was, yeah, let's not watch the stream on here while we're watching the stream. <laughs> so um, this was this, and when I wrote this, like, you know, which was back, you know, five weeks ago, I thought, oh, that'll be a piece of cake using these tools. No. What did I know? <laughs> so uh, next week, we're going to have a little more fun with um, with controllers, with TV stuff. Um, th this is really going to be around like putting yourself in the headspace of doing uh, user interfaces with TV controls, right? Controls on a TV are minimal. It's kind of like a keyboard. A, a remote control is kind of like a keyboard with only like four buttons, you know? And, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other buttons and some remotes, but you know, like it, you, you want to be thinking like left, right, up, down, and what you can do with that. And then we're going to take a little break and have some fun with um, this. Will probably be more like today's session, um, but this is going to be about building a Nintendo cart. And I've been discussing that very briefly with uh, 88 bit music. I don't know if any of you have checked him out. He plays fantastic video game music um, performances. He's actually going on later today uh for a friday evening session and he you know you can 
donate some money and he'll do requests or if it's a slow time or if you're new he'll actually always do requests for new people he won't do it for me i keep telling him i'm new but he's like no and he's got a whole bunch of like fun little nes um uh game ideas and so i said hey maybe we'll just do that on the show you know i mean originally i was going to do something different but yeah that might be what we do and anyway so you can check this out later um this was, like I said, quite a bit lower level. If you want to talk more about it, then, you know, come to the Discord and, um, you know, we can chat more there. I don't want to go, I think this is already like really dense. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, the, I, I had to clear, you know, the backlog so that we can move forward. And this, yes, to stew pack your question, this ended up being like way more work than I thought <laughs> was going to be involved for a show. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I've actually been all of the shows from the Friday sessions. I've been putting these on YouTube. So they're actually up here in my uh, past broadcasts. Yeah. So um, I'll I'll get this up here um, as well. So I, I think it'll be more interesting when we get to the future FPGA stuff and we're going to be coming back to this. But hopefully the tool is open source by that point. And um, that's uh, when we get down here. So we'll see. We'll see what you all vote on for viewers uh for viewers choice there okay well thank you everybody for dropping by and watching um thank you for the follows and the subs uh it's all been fantastic and uh don't be too hard on panos he's he's, he's a good guy <laughs> um and uh yeah um i will see you actually monday will be uh, so I'm, what i'm doing just format wise i'm moving the uh all lessons are happening on mondays um that's for the um like, you know, the teaching segments, which is, you know, the learn segments. Um, the uh, Friday will stick to the, I'll try to stick to the hour format for Fridays. It's kind of a dense show, but hopefully not this dense ever again. <laughs> so um, I might revise the 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 show uh, episodes after this, because this, this was too much material for one show. But I do appreciate you all hanging out and supporting. So I will see you later. I think... Um, who do we else?